Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes, as together we study Amos and Obadiah. And just so you know, this is like take two. I did the original take, and it cut off like halfway through the video. So I'm going to update this today. Appreciate a friend who let me know that, well, didn't quite work out. Here's where I'm headed as a highlight. I'm going to talk about prophets and their primary responsibility, as the Lord calls them, to bear witness of Christ and... The idea with Obadiah of performing vicarious ordinances for others so that uh, we too can be saviors on Mount Zion. Now, Amos is a shepherd, or was a shepherd, lived in a city called Tekoa, which is about 12 miles south of Jerusalem. The Lord called him to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel, and it's a calling he didn't really expect, but which he was obedient to fulfill. We don't really know precisely when the book of Amos was written. The book begins with an explanation that he preached during the reign of Uzziah in Jerusalem and Jeroboam II in Israel. And in chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. That is is a seminal event. That is an event where people, oh, where were you during the earthquake? That earthquake seemed to have happened around 750 BC. One major study, as they're studying fault lines and effects of earthquakes, and they're studying evidence of earthquakes, concluded this, quote, a major earthquake had occurred in Israel circa 750 BC. Geologists believe they have found evidence of this big earthquake in sites throughout Israel and Jordan. According to Stephen A. Austin, the magnitude of this earthquake may well have been at least S7.8, but more likely as high as 8.2. This magnitude 8 event of 750 BC appears to be the largest yet documented on the Dead Sea Transform Fault Zone during the last four millennia. So in Amos chapters 1 and 2, Amos prophesies the Lord pour out judgments upon, these are kind of the, the countries, the areas around Jerusalem. So you got Syria, the Philistines, Tyre, Edom, the people of Ammon, Moab, all because of their wickedness. Amos also preaches that Judah and Israel will be punished for embracing wickedness and for rejecting, their, for rejecting the Lord. Here's kind of the wickedness that was included in these chapters. Their wickedness includes, in verse 9, Tyre, Tyrus will remember that they didn't remember the brotherly covenant. Just to be brotherly, to be kind. Edom didn't did pursue his brother with the sword, and had cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. That perpetual anger with Edom lasts millennia. It lasts so long. And we'll get that towards the end of the Bible and into the New Testament, where that, Ezekiel calls that perpetual hatred, just keeps on going and going. Ammon ripped up the women with child of Gilead, that they might enlarge their borders. We're sacrificing women and children just to make sure we get a bigger border. Moab burned the bones of the king of Eden into lime, took him out of the tomb, and just, this is a desecration. We don't like you so much that we're going to desecrate the kings, the idea that, hey, they're no longer part of the land, and this is our truly, truly our land. Judah despised the law of the Lord, and it kept not his commandments, and their lies caused them to err. And then Israel, in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes that paint after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor and turn aside the way of meek. And a man and his father will go up unto the same maid to profane my holy name. And then you get this in verse 10. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the old wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. This is just a reminder. I'm God. I've been with you. I've been helping you. And verse 10, 11, And I raised up of your sons for prophets and for young men for Nazarites, those who have taken a vow to be able to, to uh, have that kind of covenant relationship with God. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? But the people who have given this extra covenant to be a little bit closer, you gave Nazarites wine to drink. You're tempting them to to, to displace their vow, to break their covenant. Commanded the prophets, saying, prophesy not. You're getting other people to fall from their off their pedestal, fall from what they're trying to do right, and then you're just saying flat out, I don't want you to tell me what's, what's right. Don't even prophesy. Prophets, just keep it to yourselves. 
And then he gives, for, for Amos, it's, it's a bunch of questions of, maybe should be obvious. Do lions roar? Hey, if there's a bait in a trap, is an, a young little bird going to try and, and peck at it? Well, you know, if someone has a horn, are they going to blow it? And he's going to say, I got some truths, and then I'm going to give you some examples. Truth number one for Amos. Can two walk together, except they be agreed? And the answer for him is, yeah. But the emphasis is walking together with God. You need to walk with God and be agreed with Him. And then gives an example. Okay, just like a lion needs something to roar about, you need to be with God as you walk with Him. Example number two, there's these traps. They need bait to be able to get a, a, a bird to come and be tempted to be in the snare. Just like that trap needs the bait, you need God. Hey, when there's imminent danger coming, that trumpet is, is blown, you get that learning sound, you need that warning to be able to react and escape. Just like when imminent danger is coming, you need God. And then he shares truth number two, which is central for Amos. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets to his servants, the prophets. A prophet is a person who's been called of God and speaks for him. As a messenger of God, a prophet receives commandments, prophecies, and revelations from God. His responsibility is to make known God's will and true character to mankind and to show the meaning of his dealings with them. A prophet denounces sin and foretells its consequences. He's a preacher of righteousness. On occasion, prophets may be inspired to foretell the future for the benefit of mankind. His primary responsibility, however, is to bear witness of Christ. The president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is God's prophet on earth today. Members of the First Presidency and the Twelve Apostles are sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators. So you have that truth one. Can you walk with God except you're agreed with Him? Well, truth number two. God reveals His will through prophets. And then you get those same three examples. The lion has roared, and the Lord God has spoken through His prophets. Just like lions roar and you pay attention, prophets have spoken. Pay attention. Example number two. Prophets are there to explain that Israel has sin and that sin has been a bait for them, just to snare them, to trap them, for they know not to do right. And then that third example, applying it along for that imminent danger, you get in verses 11, 14, 15, there is adversity coming. And the prophets are giving God's warning. Well, just like that back then, today we do have modern day prophets. And they do give us warnings. They are like a lion, and we should be paying attention. And they are warning us of bait that Satan is using to trap us, like a bait in a snare for an animal. President Marion G. Romney has said, I remember years ago when I was bishop, I had a president, Heber J. Grant, talk to our ward. After the meeting, I drove him home. Standing by me, he put his arms over my shoulder and said, My boy, you always keep your eye on the president of the church. And if he ever tells you to do anything, and it is wrong and you do it, the Lord will bless you for it. Then with a twinkle in his eye, he said, But you don't need to worry. The Lord will never let his mouthpiece lead the people astray. And as Ezra Taft Benson more recently, I know this is in 1966, but it remains true today, keep your eye on the prophet, for the Lord will never permit his prophet to lead his church astray. I love the words of President Joseph Fielding Smith just along these lines. I think there is one thing which we should have exceedingly clear in our mind. Neither the President of the Church nor the First Presidency nor the united voice of the First Presidency and the Twelfth will ever lead the saints astray or send forth counsel of the world that is contrary to the mind and will of the Lord. Now, in saying all that with three different prophets, there is never an apostle or prophet that I know of that comes out and says, we don't make mistakes. We don't say things unintendedly. And I think I love the way uh, Elder Uchtdorf, who was President Uchtdorf at the time, as a member of First Presidency, said that this way. Some struggle with unanswered questions about things that have been said or done in the past. We openly acknowledge that in 200 years of church history, along with an uninterrupted line of inspired, honorable, and divine events, there have been some things said and done that could have caused people to question. And to be perfectly frank, there have been times when members or leaders in the church have simply made mistakes. There may have been things that have said or done that were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine. I suppose the church would be perfect 
only if we are run by perfect beings. God is perfect. His doctrine is pure. But he works through us, his imperfect person, his imperfect children, and imperfect people make mistakes. I have found these men to be wonderful. I've loved their counsel. And I think there is just so much value in following their advice and their counsel. And I love the unity they teach. It's, I know sometimes there, there's, there's an opinion or two, but doctrine is taught is taught by the members of a quorum. They're united in it. As Elder Neil A. Anderson reminded us, there is an important principle that governs the doctrine of the church. The doctrine is taught by all 15 members of the First Presidency in Quorum of the Twelve. It's not hidden in an obscure paragraph of one talk. True principles are taught frequently and by many. Our doctrine is not difficult to find. The leaders of the church are honest but imperfect men. Remember the words of Moroni. Condemn me not because of mine imperfection, neither my father, but rather give thanks unto God that he hath made manifest unto you our imperfections, that ye may learn to be more, more wise than we have been. There's an analogy that Elder Packer used. Now, this is a story about Carl G. Mazur, and so I put a picture of him there. Elder Packer tells this story about Elder or Carl G. Mazur. On one occasion, he was going with a group of young missionaries across the Alps. They were crossing High Mountain's Peak on foot. There were long sticks stuck into the snow of the glacier to mark the path so travelers could find their way safely across the great glacier and down the mountain on the other side. When they reached the summit, Brother Mazur wanted to teach the young elders a lesson. He stopped at the pinnacle of the mountain and pointed those sticks that they had followed, and he said, Brethren, behold the priesthood of God. They are just common old sticks, but it's the position that counts. Follow them, and you'll surely be safe. Stay away from them, and you'll surely be lost. So it is with the church. We are called to leadership positions and given the power of the priesthood, and we are just common old sticks, but the position we hold is what counts. It is separate and apart from us, but while we hold it, we hold it. Now, in chapter 4 of Amos, the Lord withholds rain, sends famine, pestilence, destroys a lot of their agriculture, and the people are realizing this is judge, God's judgment upon us. And he does it, and I find it is another way of testifying. You testify with prophets, an invitation to repent. And sometimes God allows things to happen like a famine. But the idea is, please repent. The, chapter 4, they don't. And you get in verse 12, Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, this famine, withholding the rain. Here's what I'm going to do it. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare thee to meet thy God, O Israel. The message of Amos and prophets is very simple. I want to do what I can to help prepare you to meet God. In our day, President Russell Nelson has had that same message. I'm trying to prepare you to meet Christ. So this was an article by President Russell M. Nelson titled, The Future of the Church, Preparing the World for the Savior's Second Coming. And a quote from Isaiah 9, 11, 9, which I love, The Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, is preparing for the world for the day when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the world. This is uh, April 2020. Amos has some ideas. Here's how you prepare to meet God. He's inviting Israel to repent and prepare to meet God. So, for Amos, here's the easy way, and he's going to repeat it, because if you want to know what's important to a prophet, listen to what they repeat. So, chapter 5, verse 4, verse four Seek ye me, seek God, and ye shall live. And just in case you missed it, verse 6, Seek the Lord, and ye shall live. And verse 8, it's that repetition, Seek him. At the end of verse 8, the Lord is his name. How do you prepare to meet God? Seek him. A message for all, all time from prophets. In chapter 6, Amos then turns his invective on the careless and reckless rich of Israel, on those who are at ease, and the self-satisfied and the arrogant. In short, on those who have plenty and take no thought of the sad social or religious state of their country. These persons are absolutely indifferent to the threatened ruin of their people. The prophet indicates in chapter 6 that exile is to be their portion, that the nation is to be destroyed because the inhabitants pervert truth and righteousness and trust in their own strength. And he says this in verse 1, Woe to them that are ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, 
to whom the house of Israel came. In the last chapters of Amos, he has five different visions. The first four visions begin with the phrase, Thus saith the Lord showed me. So you got chapter 7, verse 1, 4, 11, 7, and chapter 8, verse 1. The fifth starts with the words, I saw the Lord. That testimony. In the first four visions shows the various judgments of the Lord upon Israel. And the fifth vision portends the overthrow of their apostate theocracy and the restoration of fallen Israel. So the visions are, in chapter 7, you get a swarm of locusts. And a little bit of symbolism there. And then you get a devouring fire. And then the third one, the master builder with a plumb line. That straight line helps you know what is straight up and down or, or, or horizontal. Chapter, And then the fourth one, the basket of summer fruit in chapter 8. And then the smitten sanctuary in chapter 9. Each has a symbolic meaning. And clearly showed the Lord intended to bring the kingdom of Israel to an end if his people did not repent. And then... As if the Lord's just trying to sum it all up, you need to listen to prophets, but you're not. I'm inviting you to come to me. You're not. Well, you're not appreciating me. You're not appreciating the word of the Lord. You're not appreciating the apostles. You get this prophecy where the Lord says this in verse 11, chapter 8. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And I pause here, and a lot of times we cause that we call that today an apostasy or a period where you don't have revelation given to prophets and apostles. And a period where people have stepped away from the truths that God has given. Verse 12, And they shall wander from sea to sea, from north even to the east. They shall run to, and they shall f and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. I love the imagery. There's wandering, there's meandering, there's running kind of frantically. I don't find it. God's word's there, but they can't find it. The prophet then foresaw this long-reigning spiritual famine of the word of the Lord. That famine continued from the last of the Old Testament prophets on, except for the period of the Savior's ministry, until Latter-day Restoration. In Amos's application of this prophecy to his own times, he voiced a warning from the Lord that the spiritual thirst felt by the young people of the time was already at hand in Samaria, in Dan, the location of the golden calves of the first king Jeroboam, and in Beersheba, known as a shrine for idolatrous worship in Amos' time. Now let me just add one little literary note on Amos. Amos is just full of the number seven. They call it the book of seven sometimes. There's seven oracles against Israel's seven neighbors. You have seven clauses in Amos describing Israel's sins that they sell, they trample, they push, they go, they desecrate, they spread out, they drink. You have seven clauses in Amos depicting the inability to escape God's judgment. You have seven classes of soldiers referred to who will not escape if you know the invitation you got to repent and desolation is going to happen. All seven are not going to escape. There's seven rhetorical questions. There's seven exhortation imperatives, and there's seven first-person verbs describing Jehovah's punishments. There's also seven verbs in the hymn that's in chapter 5. There's seven empty rituals that are described of Israel in chapters 5, verses 21 to 23. There's seven verbs describing the, the sins of the wealthy. There are seven occurrences of the names Israel, seven things the wealthy do, and seven good things Jehovah will do for Israel. And the last, there's seven third personal personal or third person plural noun verbs depicting that Israel will do or not do in the last days. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about this in the video. I'm going to put them all up on my website if you want to study them. Kind of cool just to see that what what these uh, literary geniuses have seen in Amos. Obadiah is a uh, means name, servant of the Lord. And for me, Obadiah reminds me of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And maybe that dates me, and maybe you can relate that a little bit, but you kind of picture Indiana Jones, okay? And he's with his dad, Sean Connery, at the time, and they're coming through, and they get through here on their horses, and yet this scene kind of climax where they come to the city of Petra. Now, this is the treasury in Petra. Uh, not actually full of treasure right now, probably a burial king. Uh, but 
Petra is this is talked about in Obadiah. And you know, here's some homes. I'm just kind of excited because I'm going to go see this one these days. Uh, this is a picture of the Tomb of Kings outside of Petra and the monastery. And Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, but thou dwellest in the cliffs of the rocks. You know, you got these people dwelling in rocks. And by the way, and, and if you go there today to Petra, you go to this area, that's all that's left is the rocks. There's no pottery, there's no shards, there's no fragments, there's no, archaeologists don't find anything as, as they study there. Okay, clefts of the rocks, whose habitation is high, back to Obadiah 1 verse 3, and saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? I mean, this is kind of not a power, but it's a, a large part of a, a king's highway where people are stopping and they're selling and trading. And you think, well, what happened to the people of the city? What, what made it lost for so long? Who were they? What brought them down? Well, this has puzzled people. And let me just give you like a one minute background. I'm going to go back to Israel and Edom. There is a perpetual hatred between the descendants of Israel and that of Edom. And it's lasted for hundreds of years. You go back to Numbers chapter 20. Edom is asked if Israel, as they're coming out from Egypt, can we pass through your land? to get to our promised land sooner, and they say no. Well, and they're big enough power that it's not a military confrontation isn't even possible, they don't want it, and they kind of, okay, it adds to their, their, their uh, travel land. David, uh, King David conquers them, that's 2 Samuel chapter 8. And what comes time later on when Babylon attacks Jerusalem, and now we're about 587 B.C., Edom cheers them along. It's kind of like, yeah. And then later on, it seems to help go in and help sack the city. Later, the Edomites move into southern Judah because you have all of these uh, those descendants of Israel and, and, and Judah leave. And about the time of Christ, they're there, and they are called the Edomites, Edomianites. In Ezekiel 35, 5, it's translated, the words, as perpetual hatred. Some translations have, you've cherished an ancient enemy. You're mad at them and you want to stay that way. You have this imagery of Israel, and in Israel, you go up to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, you go up to the Mount Zion. And on top, you go up to the temple. It's kind of the symbolism of Here's righteousness, you're going up to the temple, Mount Zion. Well, in Edom, they have a place where they have their little temple and false idols, and it's called Mount Esau. You go up to that. Well, every time you, we get this polarity here, Edom is going to be, be symbolic of fallen man, Mount Esau, fallen religion, and Mount Zion, communing with God, true religion. And in verse 10 and 11 of Obadiah, Edom is accused of standing on the sidelines and watching as Jerusalem is attacked from Babylon. And then in verse 12, Edom not only stands on the sidelines, but as Jerusalem is getting attacked, they find joy in Israel's misfortune. And in verses 13 and 14, it's not only they're standing on the wayside and they're finding joy in misfortune, Edom has this idea that we want to now get even. You're down. We're, we're, we're going to kick you when you're down. Well, in the end, the city of Petra is invaded by the neighboring Natabians. And in the Bible, the last time we hear of it, of the Edomites or Edomians, was with the Herodian dynasty in with the New Testament. They cho chose to use their thousand-year-old hatred um, in allowing massacres to happen and in stepping aside while the Messiah is killed. Edomites join with some of the zealots in the rebellion against Rome, and then they're wiped out by Rome in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. So far, if you, I mean, if you go there today, you see rock ruins. There is no history of Edomites today. Their cities are destroyed. They're looted. All that's left is the ruins. 
And I just kind of pause with that imagery of Edom today. Edom stood by. For us, we don't need to stand by. We need to stand up. Not find joy in other people's misfortune. And not stand in the way of mercy be given to someone else. And so if I'm Obadiah and prophesying the downfall of why they fall, well, the summary, the pride of their heart, verse 3, they have no understanding. They're, list, they're allowing violence to happen. And they don't help others, especially Jerusalem, the saints, in the time of their distress. They are a part of the world, the worldly way of looking at things. And for Obadiah, he wants just the opposite. Not stand by, but stand up. To go into action to help others when they can't help themselves and become a savior for them. So in verse 15, the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, and it shall be unto thee. Thy reward shall return to thine own hand, head. And now the invitation. Verse 21, I don't want you to stand by, but I want you to be a savior. I don't want you to be part of a, of a desecrate religion. I want you to be a counterfeit. I want you to come up to the Mount Zion, to the temple. The invitation here of Obadiah is for people to be individuals to stand up for others who can't help themselves and become saviors on Mount Zion, to judge the Mount of Esau and that kind of corrupt, counterfeit religion. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Joseph Smith asked the question, but how are they to become saviors on Mount Zion? I'm going to read the whole answers, but his whole answer is by performing vicarious ordinances for the dead. His answer by building their temples, erecting their baptismal fonts, and going forth and receiving all the ordinances, baptisms, confirmations, washings, anointings, ordinations, and sealing powers upon their heads, in behalf of all their progenitors who are dead, and redeem them that they may come forth in the first resurrection, and be exalted to thrones of glory with them. And herein is the chain that binds the heart of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, which fulfills the mission of Elijah. The saints have not too much time left to save and redeem their dead, and gather together their living relatives that they may be saved also before the earth will be smitten and the consumption decreed falls upon the world. I would advise all the saints to go with their might and gather together their living relatives to the temple that they may be sealed and saved that they may be prepared against the day that the destroying angel goes forth. And if the whole earth should go to with all their might and save their dead, seal their posterity and gather their living friends and spend none of their time in behalf of the world, they would hardly get through at night before night would come wherein no man can work. Truly, as Elder Cook has said, we can perform vicarious ordinances and truly become saviors on Mount Zion. So, teaching thoughts, I, I love that idea with prophets. I love the imagery that Amos gives. Uh, how are words of, of, how is the roar of a lion like the words of a prophet? What snares are prophets warning us to avoid today? The snares of sin. And kind of the, that other thing is, when do you feel that prophets' voices are like a trumpet, like a warning? What are they, what are they warning us about? And I just love the question that, that I think I've asked before that I think was really was a, a President Eyring question. When was the last time you felt you were in the presence of a prophet? And maybe more personally, how has following the prophet blessed your life? And I had one last thought. There's an old saying. Catholics say the Pope is infallible but don't really believe it. Mormons say the prophet is fallible, but don't really believe it. I don't believe it in any other way. We have blessed to have great prophets. And yes, they make mistakes. But man, I know they're prophets of God. And I love them. You have a great day. Keep smiling. See ya.